will disappoint the audience because I will talk not only about the specific pharmacological treatment of substance use disorders, but I would rather have an objective to inform you about the recent technical tools and guidelines developed and disseminated by the World Health Organization in this field. So that's why I apologize, but I'm sure that the, pan the panelists today will go in depth in particular areas of uh, management of substance use disorders. So let me just remind you that uh, from WHO perspective, there are five major areas of addressing the world drug problem. First is prevention of drug use and reduction of vulnerability and risks, treatment and care of people with drug use disorders, and our panel today is focused on that, prevention and management of harms associated with drug use, or in other words, harm reduction, access to control medicines, and monitoring and evaluation. So this is basically the framework in which the World Health Organization operates in uh, this area. I would like to inform you about the very recent development. Uh, the, our Director General recently launched the Mental Health Flagship Program, which is aimed at the universal at promoting and implementing universal health coverage for mental, for mental health. Though the title is for mental health, but in fact this initiative, which is very much oriented towards development of treatment services, towards providing access to essential medicines and important pharmacological agents for treatment of mental disorders, uh, in uh, uh, developing policy uh, facilitating universal health, act, health coverage, uh, policies, treatment governance, etc., etc. But what is important is that mental health conditions, which are the focus of this initiative, include mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. So as this initiative will uh, roll out, we will see the results and we will, in our team, we will contribute uh, for, to this initiative from the perspective of substance use disorders. Many of you know the uh, WHO guidelines which uh, are devoted to uh, early interventions or management of substance use disorders. And here are selected uh, documents which are, uh, which are done specifically addressing specifically drug use and drug use disorders. Uh, the, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't find uh, time and resources to update the guidelines for pharmacologically assisted, for a psychosocially assisted pharmacological treatment of opioid dependence, but definitely these guidelines from 2009 require some update. Though all the recommendations, and we are very happy to hear that from many people, uh, that all recommendations, all major messages in these guidelines continues to be valid. The, uh, the, uh, here in, uh, uh, in this uh, conference, there will be several uh, workshops and presentations addressing specifics of implementation of uh, some of the guidelines. For example, with the support of INL, uh, of the State Department of the US, together with UNODC, we are doing implementation of the community, of the guidelines on community management of opioid overdose, and evaluate this implementation. And these guidelines is basically of making naloxone available for, management, for managing opioid overdose. Uh, some uh, uh, developments are related also to some other guidelines, like uh, the workshop in this uh, conference on uh, identification management of substance use in pregnancy. The field testing of the international standards, because the standards, as you know, they were released uh, in 2016 for field testing. We finished the field testing, in, uh, and that was done in nine countries, including a combination of high income, low in, and middle income countries. And uh, uh, these uh, standards are now in the final stage of their production, so very soon you will see them uh, published. Uh, and this is the, the, some data which will be present, which uh, reflects the amount of work which went into the field testing. The MH gap intervention guide, which was designed and developed for primary health care, for non-specialized treatment settings. And I would strongly recommend to you to this uh, uh, WHO resource, uh, particularly for managing comorbid conditions and for uh, non-specialized treatment settings with high prevalence uh, of uh, substance use disorders and where mental conditions are also prevalent because it covers eight major areas, starting from dementia, to anxiety, uh, depression to substance use disorders, including alcohol and drug use disorders. So it provides a very 
practical step-by-step -step guidance on what to do, including some special advice and recommendations on managing, for example, children and adolescents, including some peculiarities of the interview, of the clinical interview of uh, this group, uh, of this subpopulation, as well as recommendations on the management of the, of the conditions. Um, the, uh, what is important is that uh, now we have a, a lot of training materials developed uh, for implementation of the image gap, uh, including the training materials, including uh, web-based uh, um, training materials, including now in development mobile phone applications. So there are many, many uh, developments of making this uh, uh, package more uh, available and more, u more useful in the clinical settings. And it, once again, it will, it, it's tailored towards non-specialists, towards primary healthcare and non-specialized uh, healthcare settings. Um, what is uh, also the, uh, one of the recent, most recent developments is the development of the brief version of the WHO assist or assist FC, so which is based on the two questions from the full uh, assist. Um, uh, it maintains the three months uh, uh, time frame for the substance use in the past three months, but it has additional focus on prescription psychoactive drugs, and this is uh, important in, uh, in a number of contexts. Uh, basically, it's important in every, in every country. Uh, but it requires testing in diverse cultural and healthcare settings before we will integrate it into the overall WHO assist package. So this work is still <coughs> pending. Uh, I would like to mention several guidelines which uh, might not be absolutely relevant to pharmacological treatment of substance use disorders, but which you may still find useful for your work. One is uh, very much relevant for overcoming opioid overdose epidemics because, as you know, uh, the roots of opioid overdose epidemics is not only uh, inability uh, uh, timely to interfere with uh, opioid overdose or uh, access to uh, treatment for opioid use disorders. Another part of this uh, problem is, uh, the, uh, is the prescription of opioid analgesics. With, with, with sometimes this prescription uh, hardly to call uh, rational. And WHO produced uh, this year the WHO guidelines for the pharmacological and the radiotherapeutic management of cancer pain in adults and adolescents. This is the most recent guidelines from WHO on management of pain, but it's cancer pain. And uh, that's why I think uh, we, now we are in the process of revising uh, some old guidelines on uh, um, uh, pharmaco pharmacological treatment of pain in chronic health conditions. Another uh, guidelines which were produced by our department is the management of physical health conditions in adults with severe mental disorders. They came out this year, so this is just a very fresh. And uh, these uh, guidelines were developed in view of the fact that people with severe mental disorders have a reduced, significantly reduced lifespan, and this is largely because of the comorbid physical conditions, and the management of these conditions requires not only pharmacological interactions, but also the system structural uh, uh, issues to be addressed, and this is reflected in these guidelines. Completely not relevant to our conversation today is the guidelines on physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep, or almost not relevant. But at the same time, I think uh, that uh, this, uh, uh, some messages from these guidelines would be interesting for you to know, because they also, also were released just several weeks ago. But these guidelines, first ever, contain the recommendations on uh, uh, screen time, which is recommended screen time for children uh, uh, in terms of using TV, video games, and uh, uh, the computer devices. Um, we, uh, from 2014, we are working on addictive behaviors in WHO, which cover gaming and gambling disorder, and gaming disorder was introduced recently in ICD-11. Uh, but we didn't come up with any guidelines based on the evidence in terms of what might be the recommendations for prevention of gaming disorder. But in these guidelines, based on completely different grounds, it was not based on the risks of 
of developing gaming disorder, but it was based just on physical activity and sedentary behavior considerations. But it recommends that before one year old, children, it's not recommended any time screen at all. And from one to four years, it's uh, less than one hour, one hour per day and less. Again, I'm saying that, that uh, it, this is very new, uh, and I think that many of you would be interested that these recommendations are coming out from the WHO, though the evidence behind these recommendations, though they are strong, uh, the evidence behind these recommendations is very low in terms of quality. Um, the, uh, well, uh, the, uh, a little bit about the activities of WHO uh, in prevention and treatment of drug use and drug use disorders. I already mentioned the WHO ENODC multi-site implementation project on community management of opioid overdose. And the training package has been developed and now it's been used already for training, uh, uh, for training of um, first respondents to opioid overdose in uh, uh, in four countries, and then, of course, we plan to roll it out to countries at risk of opioid overdose or already facing these problems. It's clinician's guide and training package for pregnancy, and the, the workshop I already mentioned. And also, another area of work and also of collaboration with uh, UNODC is development of feasible and valid approaches to estimation of treatment coverage for substance use disorders in line with SDG 3.5 and our global program of work agendas. Uh, and here, we just, uh, I want to, to inform you about that because it's exactly started today, this survey. It's global survey on progress with SDG health target 3.5. So this, uh, uh, we hope that in two months time, we will be able to collect information from member states on, uh, and the survey tool has two major sections, and this tool is basically the, uh, one of the WHO tools, it's a new one, because it's very different from the previous global surveys when we were focusing on alcohol and health. But in this survey, it has two parts. One is alcohol consumption and implementation of the global strategy to reduce the harmful use of alcohol, indicator SDG 3.52 in Sustainable Development uh, Goals Framework. But also, the second part of this, of this uh, uh, tool is the service coverage for substance use disorders. And this is indicator 3.51, when we don't have any good data now uh, for at the global, uh, worldwide. So, uh, for it has, uh, it's built upon the building blocks of healthcare systems as developed by the World Health Organization, and it includes service delivery, health workforce, health information system, access to medicines, financing, and governance. And again, we hope that uh, collection of this information uh, from member states will allow us to, uh, together with UNODC, to uh, compile the information that will uh, allow us not only to assess the situation right now, but also to monitor the situation in the future. Uh, what are the plans activities? Planned activities which are relevant for, uh, again, for this panel is uh, clinical management and review of public health responses to cannabis, which is uh, we have uh, worldwide an increase in demand for cannabis use disorders. The core competencies for health professionals to address substance use and related disorders, which is, related, which is based upon the WHO workforce health workforce strategy. We have such a strategy till 2030, and uh, for many areas of, uh, uh, of healthcare, uh, core competencies were developed or are being developed, and we, we, we plan to address this issue, these issues for the field, for our field. It's completion of the work on ICD-11 for disorders due to substance use, and this work has, was completed, and development of integrated guidelines for identification and management of substance use disorders based on the ICD-11 nomenclature and classification. Uh, just several weeks ago, uh, uh, the World 72nd World Health Assembly, a month ago, adopted the 11th revision of the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, which, as you know, is one of the major WHO tools for facilitating uh, proper diagnosis uh, and management of different health conditions in, uh, in health and social systems. And uh, this, uh, this list will, uh, this uh, is a huge 
uh, classification, which is also fully based and oriented towards e-health records. So it's completely uh, electronic. Uh, and uh, the, uh, this, uh, the World Health Assembly requested the Director General to publish this classification in six languages official, and you know that we are not selling this classification, it's open to public, it, this is a difference with DSM-5. Um, the, um, uh, it should be all digital tools and support mechanisms will be uh, put again in the public domain. Uh, and we need to provide support to member states in uh, transformation, in a transition to ICD-11 with the starting date of implementation of ICD-11 is defined as 2022. So it's still several years ahead of us. Some countries may implement it earlier. Some countries may, will definitely need a transition period that may last five years at least for some countries. Um, but also uh, that will, uh, and, and also the member states requested a regular update for ICD-11, and this update will be done uh, um, in terms of categories, it will be done every five years probably. But incremental update in terms of descriptions, definitions can be done uh, more frequently. What are the changes? And this is already uh, before, on several occasions we presented the draft of ICD-11 explaining the differences with ICD-10, but now we can say that this is the ICD-11 as endorsed by the World Health Assembly. There are several uh, innovations. First of all, in ICD-11, we provided opportunity for code conditions due to two major classes of new psychoactive substances, synthetic cannabinoids and synthetic cathinones. That's why we divided in the classification cannabis from synthetic cannabinoids, whereas in ICD-10, it was cannabinoids. We uh, we've removed caffeine from other stimulants. We, uh, we made dissociative drugs, including ketamine and PCP, as a separate category. So we also have uh, uh, more flexibility in terms of uh, uh, coding conditions with, with uh, specified other substances, and we had particular requests from uh, some developing countries about such substances as Kratom, as CAT, uh, which are difficult to put into the current classification systems. Uh, and also uh, unknown substances. We don't deliberately, we don't have a category for multiple substance use because it's uh, supposed to be and it should be very easy in electronic health records to quote different substances which are causing the condition or which are implied in the, in the health condition with uh, uh, identifying clearly the principal uh, condition which is the, uh, the target for cl clinical interventions. Uh, the, uh, if to speak about the uh, if to speak about the conditions which are uh, included in the list of clinical conditions under each of these uh, classes of substances, uh, two new things is episode of harmful psychoactive substance use, which never before, which was not in ICD-10, and which allows to code conditions which do not feel, do not fulfill criteria of let's say, substance use disorder. It means harmful use or substance abuse in DSM-4 uh, typ typology and substance dependence. Uh, and also harmful pattern of psychoactive substance use and substance dependence, we, we simplified diagnostic criteria for that. The episode of harmful use, we, we believe that this will uh, facilitate the implementation of screening and brief interventions for uh, conditions which uh, are associated or re are resulting from substance use, which are the reason for admission or for, um, uh, for, for demand for treatment, and at the same time when uh, health pro professionals do not have neither financial nor other grounds to provide treatment interventions. I will not go into the, these details, it's taxonomy, uh, but also we have, uh, as before, in chapter 24, which is factors influencing health status, we have uh, what is called hazardous substance use and hazardous gambling and hazardous gaming. And these are conditions which are not belong to mental and behavioral disorders because they are not disorders per se, but these conditions are important for providing early interventions for detecting this, patterns of behavior and to providing early interventions. 
Field testing now is going on. It's, it, it's, um, uh, it's uh, uh, there are two studies. The second study we are largely finished. With, you probably saw the publication and addiction of Louisa Degenhardt. We commissioned this work of analyzing of concordance between ICD-11 criteria and DSM-5 and, uh, uh, and ICD-10 criteria uh, based on World Mental Health Survey data sets and secondary data. Uh, and the, we are now going into, uh, into the fi fi uh, field testing of ICD-11 with this uh, list of countries. And if you are interested to participate in that, that will res result in fine-tuning and paving the way for incremental update of classification, you are welcome to contact us. And I mentioned this morning that we had the first forum, and just now we finished the second forum, and we look forward to meeting many of you at the third one in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you for your extensive presentation. Now we give the floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Parino. Mark Parino is the president of ATOD, American Association for Treatment of Opioid Dependence. Mark, you have the floor. And thank you for having me. I very much appreciate uh, the work that Dr. Guetta and his associates have done at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, and certainly for their long-standing collaboration with ATOD. And I also extend my gratitude to the speaker that you just heard from, Dr. Vladimir Posniak, for his work at WHO, the guidelines that they have produced, which has been extremely helpful. And Brian Morales, who serves as the Division Director of the Global Demand Reduction Programs, in our U.S. State Department. He's been very supportive of our work, especially working in conjunction with UNODC and WHO. I've been working uh, with some of Dr. Gadda's associates over the last several months, uh, Annette and Elizabeth, and uh, they have certainly my points of view on how to approach uh, these particular issues, especially when you deal with a global policy of improving the quality of care when we're treating patients who do need medications to treat their opioid use disorder. The documents certainly provide excellent guidance to people in our field, both in clinicians and for policy workers. Now I have to say some general observations in reading through these guideposts. The first is that it's critical to learn from past lessons in treating this illness. We have a lot of experience, there's lots of research, there's a great deal of clinical practice. One of the great dangers that clinicians and policymakers can make is they ignore the, what we've learned. They ignore the lessons of the past. This is a great error, and it's something that we work to confront all the time. The second point is that when guidance documents are produced, it's important to have an oversight mechanism in place. I've dealt with this matter for 40 years. I can tell you when you have guidance documents with the appropriate oversight, you will not have a sustained method of consistently meeting treatment goals. It's also important to have system integration, and that's reflected in some of the guidance documents that are being developed at the present time. And the truth is that systems will not integrate themselves under any circumstances. There does need to be some monitoring and guidance influence in order to bring the systems together and to work effectively over the course of time. Now, I'm also grateful to my long-term partner and friend, Dr. Ikram Manimani, and you're going to hear from him this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Manimani has worked in partnership with ATOD since 1989, and we formed the World Federation for the Treatment of Opioid Dependence with Dr. Manimani as the president and I as the vice president, and we solidified that working relationship in 2007 in developing the charter for the World Federation in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and I'm also grateful for the work of our colleagues, especially Dr. Andre Kostelic. Now, Dr. Marimani published one of my recent articles in the World Federation Journal, and it provides a history of how medications are used to treat this disorder. So now, I show you a few slides, and this slide is simply a method of showing you how much can change in 10 years. These slides are about the United States, and this 
if you look at the left part of the map of the United States, that's in 2004. If you look at the right graph, that's 10 years later. And if you look at the darkly shaded or orange colored parts of the graph you can see, this is a retrospective view of an epidemic that formed. The problem here is that sometimes in 2002 to 2003, a number of authorities were not paying close attention to how this epidemic was developing. So this gives you a quick overview and an historic perspective. This brings you up to date a bit more. You'll notice that on the, the graph point that's going up the fastest in the last several years is fentanyl. These are the highly potent synthetic opioids. And underneath that, you see heroin in the orange color. And then underneath that, you see some of the other uh, opioids that are being produced. These are the Oxycontin products. But this has shifted dramatically. What started as an opioid use epidemic from prescription opioids in the United States has now morphed over the last several years into heroin, most recently fentanyl, and now more recently in fentanyl and methamphetamine combination, which is why this is producing so much mortality in the United States. These are incredibly potent drugs combined, especially when you're talking about fentanyl and methamphetamine. These next several slides give you an idea in the United States of how the prescription medications have now been dropping significantly again over the last several years. So the bar to the far right is 2017, but you'll know in those, you'll see in those three bars to the right that this represents a very significant decrease in the prescribing of oxycodone products in the United States. This also The same thing applies to the use of hydrocodone products, same period of time. Once again, you look at the last three years, it's not as dramatic as the oxycodone products, but it's absolutely declining. This applies to methadone as it's prescribed for pain management. This is not a slide that talks about the use of methadone that is used to treat opioid use disorder in the opioid treatment programs in the United States. This is strictly for pain management. But you'll notice that there has been a dramatic decrease in the prescribing of methadone to treat pain. Also, concomitant with this, there's been a dramatic decrease in methadone mortality deaths. Methadone mortality deaths in the period where you see the green bars as being high were about 5,000 deaths per annum specifically related to methadone. It's dropped to about 3,000 deaths, and again, this is related to the use of methadone prescribed for pain. Contrarily, the use of buprenorphine in the, in, in the treatment of opioid disorder has been dramatically climbing. This goes to 2017. It's still climbing in 2018 and in 2019. This is the therapeutic use in the prescription of the drug. You will see the overall effect. Basically, it's you see these are all of the prescription opioids combined in the United States. Over the last several years, you do see the decrease as reflected in the prior graphs. Now, this slide is a bit busy, I understand. But this presents prescription misuse data from the radar system. The radar system in the United States is from the Denver Health and Hospital Authority. It tracks how prescription opioids are used and abused through a number of systems. The association manages the system that reports drug use from newly admitted patients in the opioid treatment programs. If you look at the left side, that's the, these are the opioid treatment programs, you will notice that heroin is now increasing steadily as people enter treatment. So all of these data from two different treatment program centers represent new admissions to OTPs. So this reflects what patients are using and abusing, but this is mostly abuse. But pay attention to an interesting slide. You see in the, in the light green, especially on the right side of the graph, which is more distinctive, that's fentanyl use rising. 
Now in these programs, these are generally programs that are not using medications to treat opiate use disorder. But pay attention to that sort of yellow mustard color on the right side of the graph, which represents buprenorphine abuse. This is not, if it's on this graph, it does not represent the use of buprenorphine in a therapeutic way. These are patients who would be admitted who said they have been abusing illicit buprenorphine in the United States. So what have we learned? The Food and Drug Administration has learned an interesting and problematic lesson. Several years ago, they started encouraging pharmaceutical companies to develop abuse deterrent formulations. One of the most significant came from Purdue Pharma when they reformulated the oxycodone product. And it used a hard shell, a Gruenthal product, and it did prevent the abuse of that particular drug. Now interestingly, and this, this sort of picture develops this and, and demonstrates the issue, no matter what we're doing in the United States, if we limit and we reduce the opioid drug supply too precipitously, in other words, if the pendulum swings to the other direction, and I think it has swung too far into the other direction, you decrease the access to legitimate opioids to treat pain. What you do then is you shift unwittingly into the area of having people use more heroin and fentanyl, and you saw that on a prior graph. So the summary is the prescription opioid continues to decrease as opioid deaths increase, methadone decreasing and buprenorphine is increasing, the abuse of prescription stimulants and other non-opioids are increasing, and anything that restricts the opioid supply is increasing heroin and fentanyl abuse, with fentanyl being our biggest challenge at the present time. Now, to give you an idea of the two primary access points in the treatment of opioid use disorder, this is a map that's developed by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This means that the programs are listed, and there are about 1,600 treatment programs in the United States at the present time. These are all certified by the federal government. They have to meet extremely clear plans and requirements from both the federal government and the states. These are the programs that provide access to the medications, methadone, buprenorphine, extended release, naltrexone, and with counseling and other combined services. That's a requirement for these 1,600 programs to function. There are about 450,000 patients getting treatment in these programs on any given day. The other access point is called a data 2000 practice. These are basically physician practices that primarily use buprenorphine to treat opiate use disorder. It's largely an unregulated practice. There are about 50,000 to now 60,000 medical practitioners that have been trained receiving an eight hour training. The interesting anomaly is only half of this group are actively prescribing. So this is a very big problem for the federal government, and right now there's a shift in paradigm, which I will get to in a few minutes. So these are the demographics of the OTPs. It's about 1,600 in 49 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And there's a significant growth in treatment capacity. We've increased the number of programs and patients over the course of the past two years. And with buprenorphine treatment, it's increased by 291% based on the NSATS reports over the last 10 years. It's very significant in terms of a point of growth. So the discussion about whether addiction is a medical disorder or a moral problem have a very long history. And for decades, uh, the studies have reported that opioid use disorder is a medical uh, condition and that you have to deal with the disorder by treating the patient effectively with medications in combination with counseling. So let me say a few things about this as I begin to wrap up. One of the critical policy debates in the United States at the present time is the focus on increasing access to the use of medications. And a recently released report from the National Academies of Medicine has indicated that a paradigm shift seems to be afoot in the United States, basically saying the focus is medication first, medication only. 
The medication first is reasonable and it's based on evidence and long-term use. The medication only is something that is potentially problematic. If you're treating this disorder, you're not just treating opioid use disorder, you're treating a number of other comorbidities. There are lifetime uh, incidents of depression and anxiety disorders in 50% of the population we treat. A number of the patients are homeless. A number of the patients have suffered from long-term trauma prior to getting into treatment. The concept that medication alone is ultimately going to be effective in treating this disorder with its comorbidities is, I think, a false sense of reality. I understand that the, there's a need to increase access to care because in the United States, we still are in the grips of an epidemic that's claiming 70,000 lives per year. Emergency measures are absolutely required. That's not the point. The question becomes, if you focus only on increasing access to the use of medication, what do you do with the patient once you've admitted the human being? How do you engage the patient? So for questions about are these medications useful in treating the patient properly, yes, they are. Are they useful under every circumstance? Not everyone is suited to the use of medication, but if you have a problem with long-term opiate use disorder, eventually, if all other treatments have failed, I assure you, you're going to need to use one of these medications. And they have dealt with rigorous scientific evidence and analysis. So from my point of view, and in summary, what you have to pay attention to is how you treat the individual, what do you expect from that person, and what do you expect from the treatment system. There is a clash between the issues of a harm reduction public health initiative versus the appropriate clinical management of a person with a specific disease. It is a specific disease. It is an issue of both brain chemistry and sociological issues. It is not simple. It is a complex disease to treat. And I can tell you this with some authority because I spent 18 years of my professional life working in an opiate treatment program in New York City meeting with hundreds of patients over the course of that 18-year period. And I can tell you for sure that many of the patients who were admitted to treatment were always feeling a sense of desperation at the point of being admitted. It was not a sense of, I've come to treatment and I feel that this is going to be my ultimate cure and help. There was always a sense of trepidation. So in order to properly engage this particular patient population, you really do need to have some specialty in understanding this. And you absolutely need to have an understanding of how the pharmacology of the medications are used. If you don't understand it, you should not be doing this particular work. And for those who question the value of how medications are used, if they are used properly, if they are used consistent with their pharmacologic properties, and if they are used in conjunction with other methods of treating the individual patient holistically, you, then you will do well and so will the patients. So for this, I thank you for your attention, the opportunity to present. I know that the rest of the panelists will share valuable information. And I just look forward to our continued collaboration with you and ODC and WHO and our State Department. And I hope this has been helpful. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Now I give the floor to an expert in, from Russian Federation. I think the, the best expert in addiction treatment in Russian Federation coming from St. Petersburg. That is Eugenie Krupitsky, Professor Eugenie Krupitsky, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank organizers of this conference for the opportunity to come and speak here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm going to speak about long-acting extended release naltrexone for opioid use disorders. Uh, as uh, most of you know, there are three major groups of drugs to treat opioid use disorders, four agonists, partial agonists, antagonists, and full antagonists. And in Russia, full agonists are forbidden, partial agonist antagonists also prohibited by the law. So the only available specific medication to treat opioid use disorders is full antagonists, naltrexone, and in Russia it is 
relatively easy to have someone inducted on naltrexin because every treatment of opioid use disorder starts with detoxification and we have very well developed a network of addiction hospitals, at least one in each of administrative regions where patients are hospitalized for uh, inpatient detoxification. Now, Trexin is available in the variety of drug formulations, oral, implantable, and injectable. And uh, our first uh, studies were focused on the oral form formulation. We studied oral naltrexone alone, uh, oral naltrexone in combination with antidepressants. The major idea was to reduce with antidepressant uh, depression, anxiety, and anhedonia, and thus improve uh, adherence to oral formulation of naltrexone. Um, then we studied the combination of oral naltrexone with guanfacin. The idea here was to reduce stress, impulsivity, and signs of protracted withdrawal. And these studies clearly demonstrated that oral naltrexone uh, is effective only if it is properly supervised in combination of oral naltrexone with either antidepressants or guanfacin did not increase efficacy uh, significantly. The major problem with oral naltrexone is adherence. Uh, drugs don't want work in patients who do not take them, as said Everett Coop. Uh, so the question was, how can we improve naltrexone treatment? And this uh, NIDA monograph, Narcotic Antagonist the Search for Long-Acting Preparations, was published in 1976, as you can see. Uh, and only 30 years later, the first long-acting sustained release formulation appeared on the market. It was implantable formulation. Naltrexin implant uh, has to be surgically subcutaneously implanted into the anterior abdominal wall. It's a sort of minor, minor surgery. According to the data from manufacturer, it works for uh, at least two, three months, according to pharmacokinetics data. And we carried out a double-blind, double-dummy, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial of uh, naltrexin implant versus oral formulation and double placebo. And this study demonstrated that uh, proportion of opioid negative urines was significantly higher in naltrexin implant group, red line compared to um, oral naltrexin green line and uh, double placebo blue line. Uh, retention in treatment was significantly better in naltrexin implant group compared to both oral naltrexin and um, double placebo group. Uh, at the end of six months treatment, 53% of patients in naltrexin uh, uh, implant group completed trial compared to 16% in the oral and 11 in the double placebo group. And I would like also to mention that uh, naltrexone implant reduced uh, HIV drug risk uh, behavior measured with risk assessment battery, which is important because approximately 30 to 40% of uh, patients with opioid use disorders in Russia are HIV positive. Uh, the major problem of naltrexone implant is wound infection, surgical adverse events. The rate of wound infection uh, in naltrexone implant group was 5%, five times higher than in the oral uh, naltrexone and double placebo group. Uh, um, so on implantable naltrexone demonstrated greater effectiveness in the treatment of opioid use disorders in comparison to oral naltrexone and double placebo. And it basically was well tolerable, uh, tolerable, tolerable, except the problem with a local site reaction with a wound infection. There are some other limitations of naltrexone implant. It is surgical procedure. Uh, it is wound infections, I already mentioned. It is also cosmetic defects, scar. Uh, uh, another problem is uh, it, it is relatively easy to take out within the first few weeks after the implantation, and it does not provide uh, two, three months long blockade in some patients. It gets encapsulated with interstitial tissue, and it doesn't work. 
Even so, the proportion of those is relatively small, also about 5%. So the question is uh, whether or not we have something else to treat uh, opioid use disorders better. And the answer is yes. It is injectable formulation of naltrexin. Uh, injectable naltrexin, Vivitrol. You know, there is something with remote control. Okay, injectable naltrexin, uh, Vivitrol. Uh, uh, it includes... Uh, uh, naltrexone and within the special microspheres, biodegradable microspheres of polylactic glycolide. And when these uh, microspheres uh, are injected into the body, they get hydrated and naltrexone uh, is starting gradually to diffuse initially from the superficial levels and later from the deeper levels of these microspheres. And according to the data from manufacturer again, uh, naltrexone, uh, injectable naltrexone blocks opioid effects for at least uh, four weeks, about one month. Could you please, uh, yeah, next one. Okay. Uh, so this is a pharmacokinetic of injectable naltrexone that blocks opioid effects for uh, about a month. And uh, we uh, did a study of extended release injectable naltrexone for opioid use disorders, double blind randomized clinical uh, trial versus placebo. Uh, so we demonstrated the primary outcome was proportion of opioid negative urines, which was approximately two times higher in injectable naltrexone uh, group compared to placebo. And uh, retention in treatment was significantly better in naltrexone, injectable naltrexone group. And that's probably the most important uh, outcome for healthcare practitioner because retention means uh, recovery. Uh, I would like also to mention that uh, injectable naltrexone also reduces uh, HIV drug risk behavior, which is important as I already mentioned. Uh, tolerability of uh, injectable formulation of naltrexone was better than implantable one. And uh, uh, based on the results of our studies, uh, injectable naltrexone was uh, FDA approved in the US initially and one year, la uh, one year later in Russia. Uh, Nora Volkov mentioned injectable naltrexone as one of two major advances in the treatment of opioid use disorders. And in the recent uh, manual of uh, international standards for treatment of drug use disorders, injectable naltrexone is quite well uh, represented. <laughs> Still trying to get next slide. Could you please help me? Okay. So, uh, overall conclusion from our naltrexone study. Oral naltrexone is effective if properly supervised. Long-acting sustained release formulations naltrexone implant is more effective than oral. It is long working, two, three months, but it is uh, related. To, it, it, it requires minor surgery and uh, related risk of surgical adverse events. Injectable naltrexone, Vivitrol, easier to use. It has good tolerability um, and uh, it works shorter, unfortunately, just one month. Uh, both uh, injectable uh, and implantable formulation reduces HIV drug risk behavior. But the question was whether or not uh, extended release formulation of naltrexone might help um, uh, to improve adherence to antiretroviral therapy in patients with opioid use disorders and in its turn its efficacy. To address this question, we carried out the study of naltrexone implant versus oral naltrexone in HIV clinic. Uh, 200 recently detoxified uh, HIV positive uh, uh, antiretroviral therapy naive opioid addicted patients were randomized in one-to-one -one ratio to 12 months treatment of either naltrexone implant and oral uh, naltrexone placebo and antiretrovirals or oral naltrexone and implant placebo and again antiretrovirals. Treatment lasted 12 months. 
Retention and addiction uh, treatment was better in naltrexone implant groups, similar to our previous studies. Uh, in particular, uh, the proportion of opioid uh, positive vi visits was lower in naltrexone implant group and cumulative proportion of opioid negative urines was higher in naltrexone implant prodotoxin group. And better retention in naltrexone treatment uh, brought about better retention in antiretroviral therapy and uh, better adherence to uh, antiretrovirals uh, measured with special MEMS cups. This is a special technology uh, when bottle where we put antiretrovirals has a special chip which records date and time when uh, the bottle was opened to take antiretrovirals. So adherence was uh, better in naltrexone implant group and that uh, in its turn brought about uh, better Oops, could you please return? Uh, better uh, outcome of HIV uh, treatment, viral load. So uh, improvement of retention in addiction care in this study clearly demonstrated better outcome of antiretroviral th uh, therapy because the primary outcome was, uh, was uh, viral load. So uh, extended release naltrexone not just improves uh, outcomes of treatment of opioid use disorders, it also improve, improves outcomes of antiretroviral therapy in HIV positive uh, patients with opioid use disorders. And that's very important for a country like Russia where we have a very high proportion of uh, patients with opioid use disorders also HIV uh, infected. Uh, I would like to mention uh, that limitation of this study is uh, all the studies were done in a country uh, where methadone and buprenorphine agonist based treatment are not available and this is clear limitation of all the results I presented. And in the end I would like to thank uh, all my colleagues from Pavlov State Medical University who worked hard doing the studies and from the University of Pennsylvania Department of Psychiatry. I would like to thank, to thank National Institute of Drug Abuse for the support of all the studies with uh, R01 NIDA grants. And, uh, of course, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Krupitsky, for this very interesting overview about naltrexone and naltrexone slow release, sustained release. Now we give the floor to the next speaker, who is Professor Adam Bizaga from Columbia University in New York. Adam, I think we speak about uh, the, the pharmacological intervention for people affected by stimulant dependence. There's no mouse. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gilberto, for inviting me. And thank you to all of you for staying till the end of this session. We really appreciate it. So I would like to switch gears and draw your attention to psychostimulants. We've talked a lot about opiate use disorder. It's a very well accepted medical disorder with medical solutions, uh, widely implemented most, you know, many places of the world. But psychostimulants are also a pretty significant problem. The latest World Drug Report confirms that we have about 70 million people who use psychostimulants. That's twice or even more than twice as many as opiate users. And only of those people, about 15%, some people put it even higher, have a psychostimulant use disorder. But only a small portion of those people are in treatment. And, you know, people who have psychostimulant use disorder have significant uh, health and psychosocial problems. So treatment is clearly a priority. Nevertheless, most of the patients are not in treatment, and even those that are in treatment are not really treated with any medical intervention. So why is it that there is a disorder that is very similar, but we cannot seem to be able to implement a medical model of treatment with pharmacological treatment? So 
UNODC called a group of experts for a meeting uh, last two years, and we reviewed the evidence about new treatments um, for psychostimulant use disorders, and we have produced a discussion paper that is available in the front, which this presentation is a very brief summary of this discussion paper. So we are clearly accepting that medications are a standard of care of opioid use disorders, so can we find a medication-based treatment for psychostimulant use disorder. To this date, the only treatment the patient receives are psychosocial interventions, uh, but even the most effective evidence-based psychosocial interventions have limited evidence, especially for people who are frequent users, though that have cognitive impairment, as many of them have. It's very difficult to engage patients in psychosocial treatment, and the high quality treatment is very expensive to deliver. So the current framework for treatment is that most patients start treatment with inpatient treatment, with some kind of residential program where they get so-called detox, medical and psychiatric stabilization. Is usually, uh, there is a very short term use with medication to stabilize the patient, but really inpatient treatment has no impact on the drug use most people would, would relapse. Therefore, uh, one of the well-established models is to transition those patients into residential treatment, which is more longer-term program, which is based on the model of therapeutic community. Uh, it only includes psychosocial interventions, is a very expensive treatment to deliver because it's residential. It, some patients indeed have large decreases in substance use. However, many patients relapse after this treatment. The alternative is to transition those patients into a long-term outpatient treatment. And currently, the way we have it, it's also so-called abstinence-based, so only patients who are actually doing well are retaining the program. They only receive psychosocial interventions. It is an inexpensive program. However, there is a very small reduction in drug use, and therefore, the long-term impact is very limited. So I just want to make sure that we are all on the same page, that the medical framework is a key to the understanding of addiction. Um, it, it is a biopsychosocial disorder. We know it, deliver, it develops in people who have genetic predisposition. In those vulnerable individuals, use of substances changes the functioning of the brain, many functions of the brain um, that are then responsible for the symptoms, such as disturbances of mood and cognition, disturbance of decision-making capacity, abnormal reactivity to cues and stress, overwhelming craving and difficulty with controlling the behavior, controlling the impulsivity, and an impaired insight and impaired ability to care for self. So this is very much like any of other chronic psychiatric disorders. We know that once you have the disorder, most of people have a chronic relapsing course. So, this is just to remind people that uh, the medication is only one of the wheels that are necessary for people to have a good outcome. We cannot forget that other interventions are also important, the psychosocial treatment, which helps people develop skills, the, the self-help, mutual help groups that creates the framework, a network of people supportive of recovery, and of course, all the other recovery-oriented activity. The purpose of this metaphor is really that if you have all four wheels, you are much more likely to go a long way on such a train. And uh, with less than, than that, you know, the outcomes are less than optimal. So as far as the psychosocial pharmacological treatment, there was a, a lot of work that went over the last 30 years into trying to develop a medication. This is one of the graphs that, um, that presents the, the, the neurocircuitry and the various receptor systems, and a lot of medication development effort have focused on some of those, uh, some of those uh, various receptor systems. The one that has been really the most promising is the one that have actually looked at the dopaminergic synapse. And um, that's the one that I would briefly like to review. All of the other did not really have any consistent findings. 
So the most effective treatment is the agonist-based treatment, which is similar to the treatment that we have accepted as the dominant model of treating opioid use disorders. The rationale for that is really pretty strong in that, that people who are acutely use substances, they have a rapid elevation of monoamines, um, but people who use substances chronically have this chronic decrease of the functioning of the dopaminergic system that seems to be responsible for the symptoms of the disorder. And this is the, the low energy, the low mood, the, the decreased cognition, decision making, increased impulsivity. This is the reason why people are unable to remain abstinent. And the thinking is that we, if we can correct this deficit, right, if we can correct this pervasive hypobinergic states, perhaps we can alleviate some of the symptoms and have improved outcomes. Um, and indeed, the agonist type medications are the medications that will do that, that will increase the basic kind of not adrenergic tone. And we are very familiar with agonist medications. They are used for the treatment of other psychiatric disorders. The most well-known medications are methylphenidate and um, prescription amphetamines and modafinil, which is also a prescription stimulant. Um, another rationale for this treatment is that we know that there is a high comorbidity or overlap between psychostimulant use disorder and ADHD. And uh, we know that those medications can be very, very useful in treatment of attention deficit disorder. So the thinking is that medical use of this medication, the, which shares some of the effects with the uh, psychostimulants of abuse, can stabilize the patients, can keep them in treatment, and can allow them to access other psychiatric and medical services. Offering medications can actually motivate patients to receive additional treatments that the program may offer. And patients generally like those medications. Unlike other medications that we have tested, for example, antipsychotics, agonists are very well tolerated and liked by the patients. Patients are adherent to those medications. And those medications also improve cognitive functioning, which is often impaired in those patients when they present to treatment. Therefore, it's much easier for them to take advantage of psychosocial interventions when they are taking those medications. Now, many are concerned about safety. Is it safe to give prescription stimulants to someone who is addicted to stimulants? Um, and indeed, those medications are control substances because they do have a potential for abuse. So when you have a treatment program, you have to think about ways of minimizing these risks. But similar concerns have been, of course, present in treatment with opioid agonists, which are even more uh, potentially toxic medications and have been able to be incorporated into the treatment. So it's not something that we haven't done before using extended release preparation of this medication that have slow onset and slower rate of elimination will provide stable blood level, will minimize the ability for misuse and have a better adherence. And indeed, there is a potential for adverse cardiovascular events. Those are stimulants that do affect blood pressure and heart rate. Therefore, you have to really screen out individuals who have severe heart disorders. You wouldn't give those medication to someone who has unstable coronary artery disease. Besides that, medication are extremely safe. You know, as you know, children with ADHD are treated with these medications for many years, and they have a very good safety profile. So we have looked just this year, I, myself and colleagues from Brazil, Dr. Stardelli and Fidalgo have conducted a meta-analysis of the studies that were published using those medications. So we've conducted a Cochrane style of systematic review and meta-analysis. We have looked at three medications which are the most potent agonists, right? They are all control substances, and those are modafinil, methylphenidate, and amphetamine-type medications, such as diamphetamine, mixed amphetamine salts, or Adderall, and Lisdex amphetamine, or Vivans, right? So we have selected those medications, and we had looked 
at studies control double-blind randomized trials that had evaluated those medications for the treatment of cocaine or methamphetamine use disorder. And as an outcome measures, we have selected a sustained abstinence, which is whether how many patients that were treated with these medications were able to achieve two or three weeks of complete abstinence, rather than looking at decrease of use or some other measure. Sustained abstinence, especially at the end of treatment, has been shown to be the best predictor of the low long-term outcome. So there is a review by Dr. Carroll that has shown that this is really probably the best outcome of treatment, and that's why we selected that. So this is the forest plot. Just to orient you, for those that may not be familiar, we are listing all the studies that were published. And here you have a one odds ratio of one, which means that active treatment was equivalent to placebo. And if you have movement to the right, it means that medication was more effective. And here is your average for the whole group, right? And here you have statistical signal. So when you put together, this is organized by either cocaine use disorder or amphetamine use disorder. So if you look at cocaine use disorder, you see that there is a significant effect of the medication so patients with cocaine use disorder treated with any of those three psychostimulants have a significantly better outcome. For methamphetamine use disorder, unfortunately, there is no such effect. Okay? So methamphetamine use disorder is more difficult to treat. And this is, but however, when you pull them all together, you still have a significant effect. So if you treat all stimulants globally and all prescription stimulants as a treatment, you still have a significant effect. Now, when we looked at each of the medications separately, what comes out is that prescription amphetamines, right? So mixed Adderall or D-amphetamine are highly, highly significantly more effective than placebo. The modafinil, which is thought to be a more kind of acceptable medication, there is no such effect, and there is no effect for methylphenidate. Again, you have... Um, you have significance for all three medications. So the conclusion of this study is that prescription psychostimulants are effective in promoting sustained abstinence in the treatment of PSUD, especially cocaine use disorder, and we graded this as a low quality of evidence. However, prescription amphetamines were particularly effective promoting abstinence in patients with cocaine use disorder, and we rated it as a high quality of evidence. So this review has a little few more studies than the previous review that was conducted in 12, 2016 in Cochrane, published, our has been presented but not published yet, which again shows that there is an evidence that for sustained abstinence there is a significant effect of the medication. They have looked at more medications that we have looked. And they conclude also that this, there is a low quality evidence, however, the psychostimulants are better than placebo in the treatment of psychostimulant use disorder, right? So just to wrap up, you know, coming back to how do we in treat those patients, you have to have, of course, the comprehensive approach. We cannot forget that it's very important to attract patients to treatment. Patients have to have a reason to come to treatment. You have to reach out to them. You have to conduct outreach work, offering them as Gilbert always says, food shelter and a welcoming environment. And you do offer a way for people most acutely intoxicated to be stabilized. But then you really offer a long-term treatment that includes medication to help patients have less craving, lower impulsivity, better mood, better cognition, and of course being able to use less or remain abstinent as a, as a key intervention. As always, supportive, friendly, and accepting therapeutic environment will make it treatment more attractive. You do need to offer psychosocial treatments, and best if those are evidence-based interventions, uh, because do patients have to learn how to change their behavior, how to change their abnormal responses. You want to connect them with peers, uh, peer networks, and you want them to enhance the, the, the activities that will be compatible for their personal growth. 
And it's important that treatment also diagnoses and treats co-occurring medical and psychiatric conditions because, of course, those are very frequent in those population. So you want to screen and treat other substance use disorders, such as alcohol, such as opioids, with evidence-based treatment. You want to diagnose and treat psychiatric problems, and you want to diagnose and treat medical problems. And we still want to make sure that we collect evidence. As we roll out those programs, we want to collect evidence to show that those are indeed impactful and cost-effective ways of treating these patients. And I think we are planning to invite other people from other countries, perhaps to form a network of programs or countries that will want to kind of develop a protocol for this intervention and actually conduct a multi-country trial. We have discussed that at the meeting of experts and hopefully we'll have a chance to, to do it again so we can move away from just doing the, the, the academic-based efficacy research and actually do effectiveness research or even implementation research in the community. But I think we're pretty confident the evidence is very, very good, probably as good as many other psychiatric disorders, that this is really the model that we should at least test. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to reach all the millions of people that, that do need this help. So let me stop here and hopefully we'll have a chance to, to discuss it more. Thank you. Many thanks there, Adam, for this very innovative perspective. We will discuss in the future how to continue this uh, adventure on uh, responding to stimulant use disorders. And uh, now, last, as we, we always say, last but not least, I have uh, to give the floor to Professor Icro Maremani. Icro Maremani is Professor of Addiction <coughs> Medicine in Pisa. He was the president of Europad. I consider myself a pupil. He is one of my teachers in addiction medicine. So thank you. I have the floor, Icro. Thank you, Gilberto, for uh, your presentation. Thank you to all of you for coming. This is uh, my disclosure. Uh, I want to start my presentation with a statement of uh, Abraham Goldstein, Nobel Prize. Uh, drug addiction is uh, a normal illness because uh, animals and humans use the same substances of abuse. Surely an heroin addicted rat is not a social rebel, is not suffering from socioeconomic difficulties, cannot be said to belong to a dysfunctional family, nor is it a criminal at all. That rat behavior is simply a result of heroin action into its brain. It's interesting, uh, this uh, statement, because uh, the, there is uh, the history, the history of uh, the cognition, of a drug addiction, before recognize uh, the drug addiction as uh, an illness. But if uh, drug addiction is an illness, uh, we must have a natural course of the illness. And uh, we have uh, this idea that uh, uh, patients uh, can have uh, during the life uh, uh, more cycle of addiction. Uh, addiction uh, is an illness uh, uh, who forward uh, uh, through intoxication and detoxication state from euphoria to withdrawal to hypophoria, from reward to anhedonia. The outcome, the outcome of uh, survived drug addicts uh, is the anhedonia, the dopaminergic uh, system that uh, it become enabled to reward. And this is uh, the natural course of the illness. But uh, from the clinical point of view, probably, there is not only craving and relapse. Probably we must consider other clinical aspects like psychopathology. Psychopathology is a comorbidity, dual disorder, no. Psychopathology is specific to drug addiction because it is impossible that the depressed patients have, uh, have psychopathology due to depression or psychotic patients have, 
a psychosis due to psychopathological symptom, we can study this kind in this patient, and uh, for uh, addicts uh, there is no this possibility, only comorbidity. <laughs> like uh, drug addicts uh, have uh, no emotion, uh, no sentiment, uh, and no psychopathology. And the other thing uh, is uh, the stress reactivity, because uh, to be heroin in addict, uh, there is uh, some problem with uh, the stress, uh, with uh, the loss uh, event uh, during uh, the life. And so we started to study the craving, uh, because the craving now, for now, is uh, studied only from the quantitative point of view. Uh, how much craving do you have? Like in the past, like last week, uh, um, higher than higher than what you ha had uh, during uh, your life. And so we started to study the covariate of uh, the behavioral covariate of craving with the sound behavior exchange related, the time related, and so on. Because uh, it's important to consider the behavior of the patients uh, with the craving. Because the craving for us uh, is something, and uh, probably craving for drug addicts uh, is another thing. But behavior is, uh, we can observe the behavior. And so we start to uh, study the correlation between this kind uh, of DTE uh, behavior and psychopathology, and uh, we try, we, we found the significant uh, correlation. We found uh, in reality something due, in our opinion, to the substance use the disorder. We use uh, a self uh, report symptom inventory at a treatment entry, and uh, we found not eight factor like in psychiatric patients, but only five factors. Worth less than being trapped, somatization, that is very similar to, to withdrawal symptoms, sensitivity psychotic, panic anxiety, and violent suicide. And these colors are important because uh, uh, through uh, T-point, we can uh, subgroup all patients arriving to the treatment, all drug addicts. Of course, the color is of different intensity, but the color are different. And the, the reactivity to life events, there is the same life events reactivity when I become drug addicts and especially heroin addict. In PISA, we have uh, a long experience uh, in studying uh, the post-traumatic stress disorder spectrum. Uh, that uh, is the reaction very similar to the symptomatology of post-traumatic stress disorder. But uh, uh, regarding uh, the, the life events, uh, loss uh, and uh, stress uh, and traumatic uh, events, or considered traumatic uh, by by our patients, by our psychiatric patients. And so we try to study uh, survivors, young people survivor, non-substance use disorder to the earthquake of L'Aquila in Italy. And uh, young, young, young people not developing this kind of symptomatology. And 32 was the cutoff dividing uh, these uh, two groups. And uh, really interesting is the fact that uh, the majority of heroin addicts uh, without uh, a mortal traumatic events, but long-lasting long -lasting in heroin, have uh, a PTSD spectrum up to 20, uh, 32 points. They develop a sort of uh, traumatic PTSD disorder. Not only, not only, so heroin addiction is the results of a post-traumatic stress disorder. In some cases, in some cases, 
is also a consequence of the illness without a mortal uh, events in the, in the anamnesis. What do we have learned from the agonist opioid treatment of heroin use disorder patients? Well, we have learned to give at least water to the thirsty. Okay, but in some part of the world it's impossible still now to give water to the thirsty. And we want to do more, much more. But uh, we have some contradiction in the treatment of opioid dependence. The disease is recognized as a chronic disease, but the treatment in generally is limited in time. A very strange example of a chronic disease. And, and block, uh, blocking opioid receptors by antagonist opioid medication is encouraged. Blocking opioid receptors by agonist opioid medication is not encouraged. But the action against the heroin in the brain is the same, is to block receptors. But the action on the brain is different from antagonist and agonist of opioid. Antagonist doesn't support the reward. Agonists are supporting the reward in our patient. We have learned that uh, surely if we, you, if we are using a doll and his wonder methodology, the results are better than arm reduction treatment. But this is not sufficient to increase the number of treatment according to the methodology of the doll and his wonder. In our experience, we consider four steps to block the craving for heroin, increasing the dosage. The blocking dosage can reduce, minimize heroin use, but we must increase the dosage if we want to stop alcohol and benzos use. If patients start to use alcohol after stopping the use of heroin. And we must increase the dosage if we want to eliminate the dreaming of heroin when the patients are not using heroin. And especially, we must increase the dosage if we want to eliminate the craving when the patient is seeing other people using heroin. We are also convinced that the Opioid blockage is not the same for all patients and not the same during all the phases of the treatment because we have four cumulative levels of depth, an opioid depth. The first one, of course, is due to the severity of opioid illness, but uh, our patients can have an, an opioid debt due to a pain, a traumatic event, or they can have a psychopathological debt due to the presence and severity of a psychiatric comorbidity. And they, lastly, they can have a, a debt due to the stress to the presence and severity of stress. Many patients stay stable in methadone or buprenorphine for a year, and then when there is a severe loss, they must improve, increase the dosage of the opioid medication. In other words, the opioid blockage is needed if you, if you want to stop craving for heroin, if you want to stop maladaptive behavior, infectious disease and polyabuse, if you want to stop the use of heroin during the pregnancy, and if you want to control the psychopathology, but it's not needed if you want to resolve the withdrawal symptom, and if you want to resolve the better social adjustment. 
it's very easy to have a better social adjustment, but it's very difficult to stop the progression of the illness. Is the reduction cessation of substance use sufficient to stop agonist treatment? First of all, methadone and buprenorphine probably don't have the same effects on the specific psychopathology of, of, of heroin addicts. If you try to study the survival and treatment of patients with the predominant panic anxiety on somatic symptomatology or were to less be intrepid symptomatology at the start of a treatment with buprenorphine with the methadone, you have the same results. But if you consider sensitivity psychoticism and violent suicide as a predominant symptomatology at the treatment entry, the result is different. Buprenorphine is better for patients with violent suicide and methadone is better with the sensitivity psychoticism. And the, the real interesting thing is that only for people in therapeutic communities, it's important the predominant symptomatology at the, treatment, at, the, at the start of the treatment. In fact, violence, suicide, predominant patients have, have the poorer results in therapeutic community. Uh, I remember you that uh, this kind of psychopathology is uh, present in all patients arriving to the treatment. It can be very, very little or much more severe, but it's present in all patients entering treatment with the medication or treatment in therapeutic community without medication. And uh, this is uh, a, a strange result, but the people using more opioid medication during the treatment have less reactivity to stress during the treatment uh, uh, recorded by the post-traumatic stress disorder spectrum, lower, lower symptomatology. So, I can say that uh, we can avoid premature interruption of a treatment. Probably is not sufficient that the patients can reduce the intake of uh, of uh, substance abuse to stop treatment. At the present is a problem because in some part of the world and also in Europe, many, many treatments are stopped in time because there is no money to support long time patients. But uh, we think that we must consider not only the situation regarding uh, regarding the use of the substance of abuse, but we must also consider the psychopathology, the severity of the psychopathology before put off for the treatment our patients. And also the reactivity to stress must be less than 32. And of course, we must not observe, not observe Mm, craving behavior in our patients because uh, otherwise out of the treatment the relapse is very, very easy. I hope that my speech uh, uh, inserted the, the doubt that uh, the premature interruption of a treatment uh, is not uh, a good thing for our patients uh, and we must improve the accessibility to treatment and continue to treat our patients. How long? The illness is chronic in medicine for chronic illness, chronic treatment. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Icro, for this presentation. Now we have the time for a couple of questions from the audience to our speakers.
please. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Professor Adam Visaga, do you know the effect size of the treatment of cocaine use disorder with psychostimulant, comparing patients with and without ADHD? And the second question, uh, I would like to know your experience with Listex amphetamine. So the effect, we did look at that, and there is, of course, not enough studies to make a you know, statistical determination, but it looks like it has no impact. So equally effective for patients with and without. The counter argument is that most patients are not really diagnosed. That it's very easy for people presenting with psychostimulant disorder for treatment not to really diagnose ADHD because of the difficulty of collecting retrospective information in the presentation, as you can imagine. And the second question was about uh, your experience with Listex amphetamine. Right. So Vivens, I know that there is a large because I love the Listex amphetamine to treat me in this passion. Right. So there is a there is no good control study to date, but there is a large ongoing Australian study that has a very good methodology. They have published the methodology, and I think they have presented actually some preliminary experience at the mm -hmm. CPDD. And I think another one, one and a half year will have results. But I will be surprised, really, if, if it will be any different than what we have seen so far, because those are very similar medication, right? Uh, Vivens is very similar to Adderall in terms of patient's experience. Um, OK, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm from Sri Lanka. Thank you very much for giving us a very comprehensive uh, information about uh, in our, of our field. I just want to ask a small uh, question from you, sir. From, uh, from the same uh, professor, Professor Adam uh, Bisange. Uh, we, we conduct rehabilitation of drug addicts in Sri Lanka. And our period is uh, one year, six months rehabilitation, and six months we give them vocational training and then by the time they get back to the society, they can find a job with that certificate that we get, they get. And also during the time when they are, um, after they are reintegrated back to the society, we also have a system to follow up, uh, to make sure that they do not get back to the previous behavior. And uh, in uh, the capital of Sri Lanka, Colombo, uh, in Western province, uh, those guys who are getting back to the society, uh, they get back to the previous behavior, and uh, our success rate is about 40 to 45, sometimes to 50 percent. But outside the province, Western province, uh, we are little more successful. We reach about 60, 65, 70, and on. So, I personally feel that. Uh, you know, success, uh, our success rate in these people being kept without getting back to behavior, uh, the previous behavior, is uh, okay. So what I wanted to ask you, sir, that uh, you, were, you were saying, uh, giving them medical, medical treatment or medication is uh, more effective. Uh, and then what I wanted to ask you is how or how, how long or how much of time will it take for, or will it, uh, how is it uh, successful on your thinking as to uh, on, the, on, the, on the relapse rates? If you, or we should continue both medication and in-house rehabilitation. I mean, you've raised a lot of very important points and we talked about this with international standards and also with this. And really, there's not enough time to say what is the evidence-based treatment. But our, I think, uh, opinion shared by probably most of us is that long-term residential treatment has effectiveness only for a very small group of patients. Most patients do not benefit long-term from this treatment. It's a very expensive treatment. I know that it's embraced and used by, by many countries. But it, really, the evidence showing that it's effective and cost-effective is very, very limited, if any. Now, 
in the same way, I think, you know, thinking about chronic disorder that you would be able to treat with a half a year of very intensive intervention and then let them go back. There is really no evidence that this approach is actually effective, and we have seen it with OP dependence. In terms of the medical management, you know, medical support with, with the medications, we are only at the beginning of looking at that. Most studies are, you know, 12 weeks, uh, maybe 24 weeks if we're lucky. We don't know how long, but probably it's also, like Dr. Maramani just said, a long-term uh, long deal. Those are people with chronic disorder. You need to keep them in the medical setting like any other chronic disorders. You need to check in with them on a regular basis and give medications if needed, diagnose other conditions. It's great that they get vocational support, that they are supported in the communities to live. Those are all very important. But I think this, those are not sufficient for majority of the patients, especially patients who have a severe use disorder. Now, many people may not have a severe use disorder or no disorder. They just got caught using, using stimulants, and those people may benefit. But when someone really has impairment in their behavior at the scale that we, we talked about this here, I think they need more than just vocational rehabilitation. I mean, that's at least my view. I don't know if Gilberto wants to say something. Uh, our aim is really to reach a, a large number of people who are not, uh, have no access to treatment uh, today. And if we use certain tools, such as uh, pure residential treatment or counseling or only psychosocial intervention, a large majority of patients simply they are not attracted by the services, are not coming to the services. So in terms of impact on the society, on the community at, at large, I think that uh, the use of medication also for medication-assisted therapy also for stimulants could be a part of the future. Clearly, we have had a lot of disappointing and frustrating experience until now. We have to not to be discouraged by this and going ahead to mix together now what you are doing now, now without saying that is bad. What you are doing now is probably the best uh, solution you can do today, but to uh, maintain uh, your mind as you demonstrated open, you know, to in integrate also with, inter with pharmacotherapeutic intervention. Thank you, sir. Other questions? In this case, you are ready for, for going home and relax. Thank you for being here with us, and thank you to our speakers all together.